Good morning and welcome to this fourth Nordic talk organized by the Royal Danish Consulate General in Istanbul in cooperation with the Nordic Council of Ministers. We are so happy to be here today uh, to talk about the important subject of urbanization and children. Urbanization is an increasing challenge in the world and according to UN Habitat, 70% of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. This is already more than the case in Turkey where urbanization is 80 plus percent. And in a city uh, like Istanbul, of course, this is a huge challenge with 17 million plus inhabitants uh, on, of course, with a large area, but still a very dense city. And only 1% of the city is dedicated to green spaces and here we are also calculating graveyards and cemeteries. This of course puts a very uh, big uh, burden and challenge on the city administration and it does also highlight the importance of sustainable urban development, especially focusing on our children. Therefore, I'm very, very happy with today's super strong panel they all show determination and action when it comes to planning for the future of our children and their happiness. And with that short introduction, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Ms. Selva Gurdwam, and she will start by having uh, a nice dialogue and talk with Professor Yasin Chartai Seshkin. So Seda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Annette. It's quite a pleasure to be moderating such a wonderful panel. Um, City and Children has been close to my heart uh, for, for a long time, um, and uh, to be in conversation with uh, such experts and enthusiasts on the subject is uh, quite an honor. I'm very privileged. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Yasin Chatay Sechkin uh, for, um, for our conversation. Um, he has graduated from Mimar Sinan University as an architect, uh, he has a degree in history of architecture and um, as well as urban design from Istanbul Technical University, where he has also served uh, for important administrative um, positions. Uh, Seçkin has continued his um, studies with a postdoctorate research uh, in sustainable landscapes at the University of Louisiana. And recently, in uh, 2019, he has been appointed the head of Met Istanbul Metropolitan Municipalities Park Garden and Greens Areas Department. Uh, we are very excited as, uh, as citizens of Istanbul to have uh, such, um, such expertise leading a uh, very important department. And um, Chatay, I'm very excited uh, to be in conversation with you today. We've been working together for almost three years now, uh, so it's, it's such an honor. Um, Thank you. I, um, I have to say, since the change in administration, uh, it has been very obvious the change also of tone of uh, how the city wants to approach the public spaces. Uh, suddenly we started seeing signs that said it's okay to sit on the grass. This is a quite a change of mentality and we're very curious what is driving this. Would you like to tell us some words on that? Um, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your nice words and uh, I would like to thank you all for inviting me here. Uh, actually, uh, as you know, parks and recreation departments play an active role in the physical, social and psychological development of the urban population. Uh, someone can positively affect through park and recreation, whether they can um, talk a walk on a trail, a fitness class at a park or uh, just reaping the benefits of clean air and uh, water because of preserved open space. Um, as you know, environmental problems arising with globalization negatively affect the population living in cities. Uh, and for providing the continuation of this cycle, creating sustainable environments and using natural resources studiously are key factors for us. And we know that all these will be possible by focusing on uh, studies on biodiversity, Mm, wildlife and sustainable landscape, uh, wa water and energy consumption, and um, of course the use of renewable energy resources. And uh, because of these realities, uh, all kinds of work performed in our department are carried out 
within the framework of uh, our three criteria. These are very important for us. First one is increasing social equality and participation. And second one is human child health, uh, human and child health. And third one, sustainability and protection of the urban ecosystem. Um, uh, let's look at this criteria one by one. And uh, for example, what do we understand from increasing social equality and participation? Uh, actually, uh, basically all people should benefit from urban green spaces under the same conditions, you know, uh, regardless of age, gender, income and disability. Uh, so we keep this in our mind and we are doing all our work in this direction. And uh, according to your question, what we have done so far, first uh, we established a design office in the department. Uh, while establishing this design office, we also um, started to create a management system for the green areas because, you know, uh, a design office without data will not uh, make sense. And uh, with the design done by this office and uh, the information from the management system, we, we uh, started to talk about what we will do in the districts of Istanbul where we do not have enough opportunities for physical, social, and psychological well-being. Uh, and apart from that, uh, when we say increasing uh, social equality and participation, uh, we also understand that planning, design, construction, maintenance, and management states of urban green open spaces are realized with social participation, cooperation, and consensus. Uh, right now, uh, we are adopting this principle in all our projects. Uh, and again, we tend to train our units at many points. Uh, we are doing some work on children's playgrounds, for example, and bo both on field and inside with uh, valuable for, uh, par participants, uh, participants, participants, participants from abroad and Turkey, I'm sorry. Children and play are uh, very valuable for us, you know, uh, this is not just a subject of designers. We needed support from many branches of science. Considering this fact, uh, we created a study group for this subject and also established a new unit. Uh, actually, you know that with the name of Play and Recreation Directorate. Uh, today's, uh, you know, our cities need sustainable, accessible, inclusive, safe, and creative solutions. And we aim to develop our playgrounds in accordance with the needs of all users and to and this is very important for us and to involve istanbul from a city with playgrounds to an entirely playable city uh, in this context uh, istanbul metropolitan municipality parks and recreation department is implementing a new model uh, that determines play and physical activity as a focal point in recreation areas in order to create a more livable city uh, through Oyun Istanbul. Uh, I think you never heard that before, but Oyun Istanbul in English, uh, play Istanbul, and it aims to develop and diversify play and physical activity opportunities. Uh, we believe that uh, a city more suitable for children to live is a better city uh, for everyone. And Oyun Istanbul carries out research, production, and cooperation in order to create a city where everyone, especially children, can fully enjoy the right to play. And uh, actually, I can talk until the morning play, uh, what the uh, importance of the play, but maybe uh, I have to keep short here. And um, play creates an environment for, you know, meeting and socializing with friends and also set ground for children's imagination and creativity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, modern city life and its difficulties have uh, caused a great decrease in children's outdoor play and uh, daily physical activities in recent years. Uh, uh, sure. I'm curious, um, how, how is the interchange happening between uh, the Danish-Turkish collaboration in this um, new setting up both of the design office and the um, and the new strategy? Actually, actually as you know, uh, we, we have a good partnership with uh, uh, Danish-Turkish firm uh, and also we have a good partnership with 
for example, Helen Ebelong and uh, Einar, and, uh, you know, uh, we, they, they visit us several times and uh, we try to make some uh, courses, seminars with our uh, unit members. And also we try to develop some uh, design programs, education programs. And uh, these are, uh, I think, our, uh, examples of our ex uh, partnership. Would you be able to um, kind of summarize very shortly what, what is it in the Danish, um, especially maybe in Copenhagen, that you admired um, in terms of outdoor spaces and play? Actually, uh, when we traveled to uh, Denmark, uh, you know, we visited several uh, examples of playgrounds and uh, places. Actually, uh, how can I say? Uh, actually, we may uh, we uh, actually I, I can say uh, I think we got ma many experiences from there, uh, from uh, Denmark. I always admire the simplicity, um, I think, that um, Copenhagen, um, and the practicality and the simplicity of some of the design solutions. And it will be very exciting to see Hilda's work uh, and uh, to talk about it after after your co our conversation now, Chatai. Um, and actually, I, I would also like to um, underline that this all is changing uh, to a degree with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic, all of the cities are re-evaluating what's happening in their public spaces. And I'm sure Istanbul has learned a lot as well. Would you like to say a couple of words on that? Uh, of actually, the pandemic? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I can say uh, something about that. Uh, actually, uh, you know, over the, you, you know, last year we, we have learned to change our routines and uh, adapt to new uh, norms and a new uh, reality. And, uh, 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 actually, uh, uh, the, actually, the, uh, this extended time. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm check my notes because I take some notes about that. Sorry for that. Please. Um, um, I mean, I have to maybe, for the sake of our audience here, say uh, Istanbul has been in quite strict lockdown for almost a year in terms of for children. It's a, uh, it's. If schools have been out since March last year, um, in, with opening intermediate, you know, for for a brief while in the spring, but then kind of closing down again. So uh, I think the city, children's experience has of the city has changed dramatically over the last year. Um, yes, 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 changed dramatically. But uh, we have seen people and children eagerly flock to the gardens, actually, uh, neighborhood parks, and all kind of. Uh, green spaces during the pandemic and uh, you know this is not surprising considering the many physical and mental health benefits of connecting with nature including uh, you know uh, lowering stress mental fatigue uh, depression uh, anxiety uh, and improving our mold making uh, you know green spaces accessible to everyone in the community can be a uh, challenge and uh, during this public, uh, this uh, pandemic, public green space has been the arena for uh, confronting a dramatic change in social cause, especially, and it's very important also for children. You know, in the first phase of the lockdown, uh, we were no longer, yes, we, we can uh, walk around the parks and it is not closed in Istanbul, but we were no longer permitted to sit in the parks. and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the traditional objects uh, that furnish our green public realm uh, were also taken out of use. Uh, you know, in Istanbul, I, I think it's the same for all around the world, but from, you know, police lines, uh, cordoning of playgrounds, uh, to taped up picnic tables and benches, and uh, with warning signs that were in a pandemic, they are all visible around. and. Uh, that's a huge change, I think. And also, you know, uh, a new science uh, entered the sphere. Uh, you, you remember the graphic of two figures and separated by a row. Uh, it's a new code, actually. And uh, also, again, uh, one more different thing for us. You know, according to classic park design features, 
such as um, meandering lanes, narrow paths, uh, have also been tested. And, you know, um, we tried to find a way how best to keep social distance with ease in crowded parks. So, uh, I think it's clear that old forms of casual strolling uh, can no longer apply. So, uh, right now we are trying to uh, create new designs and we are now trying to find new paths. And, you know, uh, I think new style of walking uh, will reimagine re -imagine these spaces again. And with the, um, I would just like to go back to the play uh, Istanbul strategy. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, what do you see as the immediate next steps, um, Chatai? What what are the first three dreams that you want to implement in in the next year? Uh, actually, first of all, you know we are trying to finish our uh, play uh, master plan uh, for Istanbul. Uh, it's it's very uh, you know it's very important for us, and uh, also you, we made some you know workshops and uh, about play and children, and also uh, you know uh, I told uh, a few minutes ago uh, we created a new brand uh, with uh, the name of Oyun Istanbul. It's very for, uh, important for us, and we make our all our. Uh, all activities under this brand or in Istanbul and we make some connections internationally and also nationally and you know uh, for especially we would like to create an active social life in uh, in everywhere so you know there are some problems such as uh, sedentary life that accompany health problems you know you know childhood obesity and uh, screen addiction and uh, we are, uh, I think that's a social duty and we are responsible uh, to create a uh, solution for this. And uh, within the scope of this duty and um, responsibility, we want to work with all citizens uh, under this program to imp improve play opportunities for children and youth in the city and to uh, contribute to community life. Uh, there is one last question uh, from the um... Uh, from the audience uh, watching the live streaming, uh, it, it is about uh, programming play areas. Is that also a part of your strategy that there could be play workers or performances um, or play sessions organized in the uh, in parks? Yes, after pandemic, we are dreaming to do that. Uh, yes, yes, it's in, in, in yeah. So this is a super exciting, I think, opportunity, and hopefully, a lot of uh, people listening to this uh, broadcast now. Um, we, I hope it's exciting to everyone that uh, we have a new new administration looking forward to activating play spaces and thinking through the city from ch children's perspective. So thank, thank you so much, Atay. It's uh, quite inspirational to see and talk about the work. Thank you. Uh, with this, I would like to turn to Helle, Helle Nebelon, um, an old friend by now. Um, it's, it's really quite a pleasure, Helle, to have you in, in this call. Um, Hele is a um, is an architect, uh, a landscape architect, and a member of uh, a ma with a master of um, public management. Uh, she is specialized about uh, and very passionate on uh, creating attractive and inspiring spaces where people's well-being and creativity develop. Um, and in this uh, nature and culture and architecture, all of three of them play an important role. Uh, she is very internationally recognized for her philosophy around natural playgrounds and has um, has led roles in the Danish Playground Association and also um, has taught in multiple uh, play um, institutions. Um, Hele, it's really um, uh, quite an honor to present you. Um, I believe you will start uh, with a presentation and I would like to give you a Thank you, Selva, for introducing me, and thank you to all of you for inviting me as one of the speakers today. And hello from Copenhagen, Denmark, to all of you who are joining this webinar. I hope to inspire you by sharing my thoughts on outdoor spaces for children and families in the cities. My design approach has always been that it is very important that the urban child have daily access to nature. And I'm very focused on shaping playscapes with hillocks, and using natural materials. 
I have always looked for leftover materials and I have loved reusing old materials long before recycling became a trend and now a necessary lifestyle. I have since long observed that fixed play equipment is not very attractive for children in the long run. Children are much more attracted by a natural shaped landscape where everything is not demystified beforehand and where they are forced to use their own imagination and to invent play and socialize through sharing fantastic ideas. Denmark has a long standing and a solid reputation for promoting children's right to free play. And I would like to share with you a six minute scene from the very award, uh, very beautiful and award winning documentary film, Nature Play, Take Childhood Back, filmed by Danish director of phot photography, Daniel Stilling. Could you please play the video? In and around Copenhagen, there are many diverse playgrounds. It has always been an issue for the city of Copenhagen to make playgrounds that are diverse, so that people, they have different kinds of places to, to visit. In the city of Copenhagen, there are 22 manor playgrounds that are open to the public all day. And children can come there for free and play whatever they would like to play. And they could have a bonfire and things like that to do an urban and gardening. And there will be a, a lot of nature elements. Well, a nature playground is a playground where most of the elements are nature. And of course, there should be a lot of uh, different plants, logs, lots of boulders, a very big area with sand, all the loose parts that children they can pick up and play with. You have to shape the landscape to make a little hillocks that goes up and down so that children they can practice uh, running up and down. Trees that children can climb in without the branches break off and so on. A big diversity in, in plants. Boulders are very uh, important in a nature playground because you can learn to climb boulders that are somehow little mountains for a child. And then you can learn how to practice climbing in the mountains without getting hurt. Loose parts are very important in a nature playground because all the loose parts are what make children invent all their plays. In a nature playground, of course, loose elements from nature are the most important. And that could be sand, it could be water, it could be little stones, it could be all the things that come from the plants, berries, acorns and, and all that stuff. So in Denmark, every children, they, they like to have a rope from a tree, a rope coming down and you can swing in it, uh, you know, like Tarzan or things like that. I don't know if children today, they know Tarzan, <laughs> maybe, but they could have some great uh, play in and, and practicing, you know, not falling down from a rope uh, and climbing up a rope is a very difficult exercise that children, they have to try to do over and over again to learn this skill and uh, you know manage that skill. Climbing trees and locks are very important in a nature playground. To climb and uh, balance in a very uh, natural uh, element that is not you know standardized so you have to be aware all the time of where to put your feet not to fall down. So you practice all your physical motor skills when you climb these trees or logs. It's very important with mounds or hillocks. If you have hillocks, if you shape the landscape and it is not just flat, then you have to, you know, practice going up and down. And for the little children to practice walking up a hillock and running down. And they do it again and again because they are getting so much in contact with their own body and they have this fantastic feeling of I can manage this walking up running down walking up running down and if you take a, you know a standardized typical playground that you see all over the world with the rubber surfacing in bright colors it's totally flat you won't have this experiences of you know getting your fingers into the soil and that is very important it's very important that there will be some places in a playground where children they can play on their own and that could be hiding places shaped by uh, 
plantings and things like that where they cannot be supervised by the grown-ups. So the children have to get this freedom to play on their own without having the grown-ups interrupting them all the time. If you have a lot of trees, for instance, you have beautiful shade underneath the, the canopies and children, they can play underneath the trees when it's very hot so that they got not sunburned. And when they are playing underneath, you know, this beautiful green canopy on a sunny day, they will have this fantastic, beautiful experiences of the, the sun coming through the leaves and make, you know, little light spots on the ground. And I have often seen children, they are very fascinated by these light spots that come through a canopy when the sun shines. As a designer, of course, I also think that, that a nature playground should be beautiful. And I, you know, somehow I make a design that has an overall aesthetic uh, shape. That is nothing that children maybe, they can't maybe see it when they are here, but somehow it influences the play that there is an overall design and aesthetics in it, even though it looks quite chaotic. But if you, uh, if you take a look at this nature playground in, um, in Valby Park, everything is very organically shaped with lots of paths that goes through the whole playground. Uh, not, not straight paths, but they are very uh, circular and snape shaped And then there is an, one very geometrical overall element, and that is the circular bridge that somehow embraces the whole playground. And uh, you know, that makes a structure that you maybe don't see it as a child. Somehow it influences your play and it feels, maybe it feels nice and safe that there is this uh, embracing element. In 1943, we had the first adventure playground in, in Denmark called Skrammel Leipladsen, that means the junk playground. And we have still quite a lot of these playgrounds in, uh, in Denmark and they are very popular, especially to the children. They can come and play with uh, different kinds of materials. They can uh, construct and build their own houses, play houses, you know, use saws and hammers and needles and learn how to do things like that. So it's very practical. So I hope you enjoyed the scene and you can learn more about this film uh, if you go and visit natureplayfilm.com. It's a very beautiful film. It's an old, very well documented knowledge that nature has uh, affects the human health and the quality of life. Usage of urban space in nature has now become significantly important. Coronavirus restrictions mean that we are relying on our outdoor spaces more than ever. It's the same challenges uh, all cities around the globe are facing these days. The COVID-19 crisis has shown how quickly each individual has adapted to the new normal and has managed to create his or her own spaces and frameworks in response to the crisis. This is man's strong survival instinct that prevails, I think so. Coronavirus restrictions have changed the everyday lives and habits of people all over the world. And this could be an opportunity to learn from each other how to get the best out of this situation. There's a momentum now for all of us to contribute in making a better world. The, pandem the pandemic teaches us that we cannot take anything for granted. We must fight now for living, taking care of our planet, and appreciate the intangible values that causes no harm to the environments. Local councils and governments should take a closer look on the cities and infrastructure and how the city's outdoor spaces are used today. I'm quite sure that they will come up with a result that shows that most of the, most of the city's square meters are targeted cars and other vehicles, whether it is roads or car parks. Cities should really consider halving the space that cars have today and change this huge amount of asphalted square meters into green spaces targeted the citizens. Make it difficult being a car in the city and make it easy to be a pedestrian or a cyclist in the city. So.
make more streets, one-way streets or dead-end streets and combine the reduced car square meters with nice spaces where people can meet and where children can play. Copenhagen has a long-standing reputation for city planning with people in mind. For almost 60 years, from the first car-free pedestrian street was opened in Copenhagen, until now the city has become more and more human, a human capital, at the latest with the metro line and lots of bicycle lanes across the city, connected by beautiful architectural bridges across the harbour. I was, I was employed by the city of Copenhagen from 1994 till 2006. And in these years, there was a change in both the political system and the way the, city, the city's employees worked. It changed from being a very closed and non-cooperative system to a much more open system, working interdisciplinary and welcoming new initiatives and ideas. The, the, politician, the politicians uh, literally put the yes hat on and pursued a welcoming policy towards initiatives from the citizens, which has led to a low power distance and a greater feeling for the individual of having influence on the democracy. And Copenhagen surely has been developed into a playable city. Play is essential and it is deeply rooted in us. We can't cope without playing. In Denmark, we don't like too many rules. We prefer using the common sense discuss things, negotiate, and find sustainable solutions. I am inspired by the Danish landscape architect Carl Theodor Sørensen. Already in 1931, in his far-sighted book about park policy, he says that children's playgrounds should be the first and most important point in a city's park program. He also mentions that it's better than that the space is large than expensively equipped and that children, they can play magnific magnificently on undeveloped grounds and actually prefer the primitive options for over, the more, over those specially designed by adults for their play and enjoyment. Sørensen, I, I call him one of my great Danes. He's famous for inventing the junk playground uh, that is run by hardly any rules, but a lot of common senses. Sørensen also said that people living in urban environments have a basic need for nature within the, frame, within the framework of urbanity, and it is society's task to meet these needs. To sum up, the pandemic could be an opportunity for cities around the globe to rethink city planning. We have known since long that being outdoor in nice green settings uh, is having a healthy impact on humans. Now let us really move nature into cities, make a paradigm shift, make cities more human, focus on the human scale, the human perspective, and put human consideration at the top of the priority list. Making a city more child-friendly means making city better for all, which Yasin has already told us. Uh, finally, I'll just mention that Copenhagen is UNESCO World Capital of Architecture in 2023 and will be hosting the UIA World Congress of Architecture. The overall theme, Copenhagen in Common, is looking back at the history and into a sustainable future, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Hope to see you in 2023. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Uh, your work is such an inspiration, and uh, thank you for sharing that uh, wonderful video as well. You're welcome. Uh, with, like, with that, I would like to turn to Zelda Janovic. Uh, we're very delighted to have her with us today. Uh, Zelda is a strategic advisor at the LEGO Group, LEGO Foundation as the lead for Real Play Coalition, Interesting Labs, and the Meaning Sphere. She graduated her Master of Business Administration from Gen University of Geneva. Uh, and she has written about global social movements in support of access to education and rights of the child. Uh, Zelda, thank you for being with us. Um, you have the word. I wonder if your mic is muted. Hi, 
everyone. Apologies for that. Um, uh, what a great pleasure to be here. I, I feel very humbled in, in amongst um, incredible panelists here. And, and I really want to congratulate congratulate everyone on uh, on in the team for bringing this group together because already I feel very inspired. Um, I'm uh, uh, here representing the work in the Real Play Coalition. Uh, and just quickly, the Real Play Coalition um, brings together UNICEF, Child Friendly Cities Initiative, uh, Arab, Lego Foundation, where I sit, Inca, IKEA, and National Geographic Partners. Um, uh, and uh, we are, and it's my privilege to represent our work, but we've been really in a strategy year this year, so we're we are almost at the point of collecting our strategy and looking forward to a bright future together. Um, I'm going to speak quickly about why play matters from, from our perspective, why we've come together around the issue of play, um, and what RPC plans to do about making play more accessible and integrated and um, uh, into everyday life. And uh, as a third point, I really want to recognize um, you know to celebrate what cities are already doing and in fact when real play coalition ran a challenge recently um the city of istanbul and all of the amazing work that we've just heard about was was um uh uh given a, an honorary mention by the the high level judges because it was recognized globally as a, as a great example um so let me uh, so why play? Why now? Um, I think uh, we heard at the top that 70% of uh, uh, of the global population will be in cities. Um, that's 70% of the world's children uh, that will live in cities by 2050. Um, but I, I think COVID-19 is top of mind for all of us. And, and we really are at the phase of facing what is being dubbed a, a mental health crisis for children. So I think there are many good reasons um, for us always to be thinking about play as an, inali an inalienable right of the child, um, but the focus right now is, is particularly important. Uh, this is a, a quote from uh, uh, um, Marin Bogota. Uh, from um, the perspective of our partners, uh, we look across the research of, of what, what play brings, and I bring this in case it's helpful to others, but this list was from across the UNICEF portfolio. Um, so we know um, that play uh, drives uh, skills development and, and learning, um, but also we know about the health benefits. And in terms of this moment right now uh, with COVID-19, I think what I would really pull out is what we're learning about um, play as a vehicle for children to process their emotions. Um, and to um, elevate their happiness. We're seeing that from the UNICEF report cards. And while play uh, absolutely is a vehicle for developing a range of skills, including in those skills, the social emotional skills, which are a bedrock for resilience and, and creativity, critical thinking, problem solving. So um, the importance of play uh, for children's skills for the future is, is um, one that drives us as a coalition. In terms of the Lego Foundation, um, it was wonderful to hear the reflections um, from, from Hella as, as she was talking about nature-based play. Um, and we see uh, that play supports learning best when it has these core characteristics. Um, so those who know Lego um, and the Danish roots of the word, they might know that Lego is play well in, in Danish and um, what we mean by playing well and in supporting those skills is that play is meaningful, it is joyful, it is socially interactive, actively engaging and iterative. And when those conditions are met, um, we can see that the, the breadth of skills that, that that type of play is supporting is, uh, is wide ranging. So Real Play Coalition, as I say, my privilege to be sharing sort of early, early peek into our new strategy. Um, we are galvanized around making play accessible, integrated, inclusive, um, and closing the play gap for 100 million children worldwide. 
we are looking at, um, uh, you know, at making the evidence around the benefits of play more accessible. We're deep diving into play-based uh, principles in urban design, and we're focusing on um, incorporating play into children's daily lives. So um, I nod here of how we're doing this. We've been working over the last two years as the uh, Real Play Coalition, and Arif has been the major driver here on a systems approach today. So um, I think we've been talking a lot in our, in our dialogue so far about the spaces and facilities for play, which in my PowerPoint slide here is in the green. Um, and we also know uh, in terms of children's lived experiences of play, that time and choice for play, so that sense of child agency is, is also important for us to be tracking and, and do they have time uh, and facilitation for play. So I think you um, asked the question, Salva, you know, animation of play experiences, and that's part of facilitation. Uh, and equally, facilitation is um, a parent or a caregiver understanding the benefits of free play and making sure that that's part of a, of a child's day and, and that those um, time and opportunities are made available to them. So this framework, um, we hold the child at the center and what we're looking for is uh, access to play. In some cases, we might see that's more so in the home. And sometimes we might see that the school system is, is excellent in providing opportunities. It might be at the neighborhood level, it might be at the city level. Of course, we'd like to see it all across through, but we, we try to map the assets that exist in the city already and then build on those assets to fill in, fill in the gaps of, of where play might be less accessible. Uh, we've been developing this in London and Cape Town, uh, and we're expanding with more cities, uh, developing a community of practice um, with resilient cities network globally. Um, and I'll, I'll glance through this quickly, but I think I share with all of the colleagues on this call um, just that our future is, is around um, creating access to play opportunities that are innovative, cost efficient, environmentally friendly, um, and co-created with children and young people. Uh, and I promised that I would celebrate what, what we've just come through and, and how Istanbul was recognized globally. So we had a challenge that we launched, launched at the World Urban Forum in 2020. Um, um, we were looking for examples of cities that were incorporating a systems approach to play. Um, we were thrilled, these are pictures of the entrance from all around the world. Uh, we were thrilled to acknowledge uh, 10 initiatives globally. Uh, and a key one of those was Istanbul and particularly top um, playgrounds. Um, so uh, a, a quick summary of, of what our high level judges really called out about what was happening in, in um, Istanbul was um, the mayor's commitment um, that, it, that is recognized. Um, the uh, uh, Chief of Play and Recreation that we just heard about, I think, is, is, uh, is being recognized as something that other cities globally can really learn from. Um, and the pop-up playgrounds, hop um, pop-up play playgrounds, which there's a picture of here, uh, really seen as uh, res um, uh, responding to the environment in a, in a very nuanced way, and, um, and the judges pulled out that work, judges included from the World Economic Forum, um, from the Resilient Cities Network, from UN Habitat and other places. So um, a real pleasure to be here, as I said. Thank you, Zelda, for sharing this uh, amazing work and uh, uh, the network of experts uh, LEGO Foundation is uh, pulling in is, I think, quite impressive. Um, what are the uh, future goals? What's the kind of agenda in the agenda for the next year? Yeah, great question. Um, so we're we're actually on February 9th or in a strategy workshop where, where I think the answers to that will become even clearer. But we're, we're making a firm commitment um, to expanding our reach um, to five cities in 2020 um, through the Child Friendly Cities Initiative of UNICEF uh, and laddering up to building tools and resources that can support 500 cities um, uh, within five years. Wow, that's that's a big 
big goal, 500 cities. Um, just the, because we have time and this sounds very exciting, uh, what's, what will be the criteria for uh, choosing those 500 cities? Can you, can you hint at us? Is it um, going to be an open call? Should we already announce that cities should be watching out for this? Yeah, great question. So um, in terms of year one, we're building the platform, right? So those five cities, um, uh, we're really working with cities where there um, is, uh, if you like, their exemplars and also that the process of selecting those, are, are, um, there's a number of set criteria, but included in that, uh, of course, is whether or not our collective organizations can support the storytelling of that city. So that at the moment is an internal process, but you're right, there is also this open process. So with the Resilient Cities Network, we're launching a community of practice where any city that has got um, learnings to share or is looking to um, learn in real time because as as regeneration plans are being put in place in cities and um, there's a lot of energy around parks and recreation, um, you know, is kind of now or never with the play agenda. So uh, we're, we're, we're creating that community of practice so we can continue to share and learn with all of the cities um, that are interested in and can, can make space for that learning journey along with us. Thank you so much. It's so exciting. I think, yeah, as you said, it's now or never. So with that, uh, I would like to turn to uh, our participants from UNICEF. It's uh, quite, again, an honor to be introducing Anna Mette Fries. Uh, she's the head of national department at UNICEF in Denmark. Uh, she holds a BA in, a degree in pedagogy in Denmark, uh, and uh, she has completed various courses on business, business administration and coaching. And since 2001, she is leading the uh, UNICEF Denmark program. It's such an honor to have you, Anna Mette, please. Um, we, when we were talking before the panel, we were talking about the Child Children Friendly Cities Initiative and the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Um, why is this so important? Um, it always comes up and could you please help us understand why is the convention such an important milestone? Would you would you unmute? Uh, uh, Typical. Thank you. thank you so much for the introduction. It's very nice to be here. It's an honor to be here, and thank you so much for listening to all the other present presenters. That was really great and inspiring to hear. And to build on Zelda's presentation, play is a fundamentally a fundamental right for children, which is right, but. There are also many other rights and they are all gathered in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is a very important treaty for UNICEF, since we are also mentioned in the Convention in Article 45 to be the organization who should uh, fulfill these obligations to let the children know about their rights. So the Convention was adopted in 1989 and it is the most ratified treaty of all in the entire world. So almost every country has ratified the convention. Uh, what is so special about it is that it addresses the legal and social status of children, and it moves the child from being an object to being a subject. So with the convention, suddenly children got their own rights. And that was the rights to both play, yes, but also to the fulfillment of basic rights, the rights to be protected, the rights to be developed, and the rights to become heard. And all these rights are interdependent, so to speak. They are all connected to one another, and you cannot just take one right out without also uh, pay attention to all the other rights. And that's what's so uh, exceptional uh, with the Convention. So there is a very important article in the Convention called Article 12, which is a paramount article. And that right should assure children the right to express their views freely in all matters affecting them. And this is a right that connects to many other rights, Article 2, 3, 6 and others. And it's a very, very important right that we try to uh, fulfill also in UNICEF and in other, many other organizations all over the world. So uh, the status of the convention in the Nordic region, region is very special because the many Nordic countries has ratified and implemented uh, the convention. All countries have ratified it and most countries has already incorporated into their domestic laws. 
Norway did it many years ago and Sweden did it last year. And also Finland has incorporated the convention, which is a very large step to take and also very important for the children and for the status of the convention. In the Nordic region, there are very many rights schools, schools that implement the convention in everything that they are doing. There is um, teaching is mandatory in Sweden, for instance, in, in all schools. So, so the status of rights in the Nordic region is very, very high. The Nordic uh, Council of Ministers are very interested in becoming the, the, the region of the world where children uh, grow up most safely and the best region uh, at all to grow up in. And, uh, and also the region is um, mentioned by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to, to be one of those regions. And that is uh, also a status that the region takes very seriously. And in this, um, uh, in this uh, effort, the convention is also a very uh, important tool to use. So you could ask yourself, why should children be involved in democracy and, and in development of democracy and in uh, sustaining the democracy? Well, I would ask, uh, 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 mention that the world will be a better stay, uh, a better place to be to grow up in. What is good for children is good for everybody. A world fit for children would be a world fit for everybody, that's for sure. And I would like at this stage to quote uh, a Chalvards academic who is currently serving as professor at the University of New York, Mr. Roger Hart, who back in 1992 developed the letter of participation. And he says that a nation is democratic to the extent that its citizens are involved, particularly at the community level. The confidence and competence to be involved must be gradually acquired through practice. It is for this reason that there should be gradually increasing opportunities for children to participate in any aspiring democracy, and particularly in those nations already convinced that they are democratic. With the growth of children's rights, we are beginning to see an increasing recognition of children's abilities to speak for themselves. And therefore, of course, uh, child-friendly cities are much more than playgrounds. It is a, a very extensive program. It's also about healthcare. It's about local transport systems. It's about leisure and cultural facilities, public spending, and much more. Play is very, very, very important. It's crucial, we all know that, but children can also be involved in many other aspects of the city's development. So what's in it for the children, you might ask? Well, we have been working with programs like Child Friendly Schools and Child Friendly Cities for many years, and we have a lot of evidence uh, about it. Um, and we also have asked children in many, many years what it means to them to have a say. And they all uh, claim that they feel stronger when they know that, that they are backed up by the rights of the child and they are much more capable in involving themselves in the development of the democracy. So in our opinion, uh, when we look at involvement of children in both cities and in schools, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's beneficiary to look at the, the entire convention and in all the rights of the children. Thank you. I forgot to unmute myself this time. Thank you so much, Annemette. This was really uh, quite, um, I think, thorough, even though quite short as well, uh, in explaining why the convention is very important and how Child Friendly Cities Initiative is not, it has to be multi sided, it cannot be looked at from one perspective, and it needs to bring all kinds of disciplines together. Now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Emre Uchkar he is uh, He is the head of, head of the Department of Social Policy, UNICEF, in Turkey. Uh, he is responsible for programs in conditional education, uh, assistance for asylum seekers, child-friendly local governance, and child labor prevention and public finance for child uh, children. Um, when we hear um, the, at, at, at the global eff efforts for child-friendly cities and um, the Nordic experience, of course, we want to go back and ask what's the experience in Turkey. Um, and we're happy to have you, Emre, to, to um, shed some light on that for us. Thank you. Hello, it's a great pleasure being here. Thank you very much for this uh, nice opportunity, along with uh, distinguished speakers, uh, very inspiring talks. 
Yeah, as UNICEF, as our mission is the realization of child rights and improve, improvement of their well-being. So this is our key mandate. And this is for all children, but especially those most vulnerable and most disadvantaged. So there is always this focus you would see at uh, UNICEF work. And the key reference is the convention, Child Rights Convention, and uh, a number of other uh, platforms and instruments like SDGs, core commitments for children, also complement this and uh, give shape to our work, a strategic focus to our work. And uh, this work is done at several scales and uh, global scale, national scale, local scale, urban and rural uh, environments are key places that this work is done. And it is done with several partners. Governments are, of course, uh, the natural partners for uh, the nationwide uh, projects and programming, municipalities, NGOs, private sector, uh, Lego being one of them, they, they have contributed in kind to some of our programming greatly in Turkey, academia, uh, and all those uh, at different scales with different partners that are best fit for the purpose uh, we work with. And Child Friendly Cities is one of the platforms that these child rights are addressed at the local level through local governance and uh, by building on certain pillars and principles. Both urban and rural, actually, this is where it is. Yes, uh, the majority of world is living in urban, it's also becoming more. Uh, urban life is an ocean of opportunities on the one hand, but at the other, on the other hand, also urban is a place where access is inequal, chances are inequally unevenly distributed, access to social services, opportunities, be education, health, play, this or that. Uh, depending on where you live in the city, things may be very easy or maybe very difficult for you to enjoy your rights and to uh, enjoy your rights to play, education, health access, uh, social and protection access. So the opportunities are vast, but also very unevenly distributed by the nature of the urban life and metropolitan life. And in that regard, uh, addressing urban inequalities, addressing urban issues is a very key policy priority for UNICEF uh, depend, uh, in every uh, country. In the rural scale, there are other challenges. Uh, because historically, everywhere in the world, rural poverty is always more than urban poverty. Things are, chances are a bit, access is a bit more difficult. Some chances are uh, lower. So even on uh, COVID-19, when there is more digital learning, online, remote teaching, etc., all around the world, uh, the children in the rural uh, areas have had difficulties in uh, accessing those systems, although they are already remote because of certain challenges associated with uh, rural services and the rural life. So in that regard, both urban and rural uh, scales have their particular challenges that UNICEF is addressing uh, all around the world and in Turkey as well. And in child-friendly cities in Turkey, uh, it has a history of like more than 10 years of time. It dates back to more than 10 years. And uh, it has been a work uh, that has done on two levels. One, individual municipalities working with bilateral working with municipalities through some work plans through some collaborations as well as with some associated bodies like the union of municipalities uh, this gives us a chance to access to a wider number of municipalities for our various programming and for children at the local level so they have both their uh, added values overall in the program uh, over these more than 10 years we have worked with near 200 municipalities at different scales, some minor, some major, but they all and uh, contributed and we work with them at different levels. Let me tell you the key thematic areas we work with them uh, that may give you also, and rather than giving too many numbers, uh, let me give you thematic areas. Child participation is one of them. So giving voice, uh, giving a child a voice. And actually, I don't like to use the word giving because children have this right. So it's not something we really, uh, give them, they are entitled to that. So it's just helping uh, for them uh, to realize this right. So this could be sometimes child bureaus, some child participation feedback mechanisms and those. So this has been one of the thematic areas we have worked. Child labor is an issue all around the world. And uh, this has been also in our focus, uh, local governance and child labor intersection. Uh, we supported local governance in the uh, elimination of child labor in the uh, in various uh, sectors and scales but for any spaces which is also heavily relevant to our uh, talks today uh, development of child friendly spaces uh, and this could be in two ways sometimes you create a space and make it accessible and also help children to get there and if 
On the other hand, if children are not able to get there, you bring the space like a child-friendly vehicles, some child-friendly mobile spaces. You also uh, take the space, although a smaller one, uh, near children and let them enjoy, uh, let them use uh, it uh, for their uh, well-being, protection, and other kind of services. And one uh, last uh, field we have been increasingly focusing in the past few years is the uh, child-focused strategic planning and budgeting at the local level. Uh, especially through our work with municipalities, because you can think of this like an umbrella work. The more children are visible and traceable in the local municipal plans, five-year strategic plans, budget budget allocations, then the chances for them for play, access to services, for participation platforms, and these are more greatly uh, realized. And also you can trace the success and failures and also see the shortcomings that the municipalities or the local government bodies can address uh, in the long run. So focusing on child-friendly uh, or child-sensitive uh, strategic planning and budgeting has this added value for long-term sustainability at the local governance uh, work. What we have done in activities in these thematic areas is that like a capacity improvement of municipal or local government staff is one thing, of course. You give through seminars and through training programs, you support the municipal uh, capacity to do child sensitive, child friendly planning and programming. Also, supporting the launching of some participatory platforms like child desk, some accountability mechanisms, feedback mechanisms are one way also uh, activities to place. Coordinating and organizing local stakeholders, municipalities, local units of the ministries, uh, provincial governorate, NGOs, local academia, universities around particular needs and around particular goals is also something we really value uh, because it also uh, helps for long-term sustainability and when and you know a child's needs are multi-sectoral across many dimensions so when you bring local stakeholders together for a common purpose around the child or a particular need of a child then uh, it is more likely to be successful in the interventions and in the programming and uh, as i said strategic planning which is a mix of our public finance for children framework and our local governance child friendly cities framework and in all these work uh, refugee children refugee response has become one of the uh, other priority areas uh, for us uh, unicef history in turkey is very long one we have been here for a uh, for decades uh, uh turkey hosting the largest refugee community in the world uh, more than four million refugees uh, and a considerable number of more than one million of them are in children that requires a special attention uh, for the realization of uh, rights of the refugee children, at which uh, we have both in local governance and also through national programming, we have a particular focus and uh, work with uh, several partners on that uh, issue as well. And one last thing, maybe, uh, the more you know about things, the better you are able to address them at all scales. So a generation of evidence, proper data about child uh, issues, child well-being, their needs and vulnerabilities is something we support uh, local governments and also national governments so that the more reliable and robust data and evidence we have for children, then the programs we develop for them uh, would be more evidence driven and more likely to be successful. Overall, uh, these are my the, the key points I would like to highlight under uh, the UNICEF Turkey's local governance and child friendly cities work in Turkey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emre. This has been really insightful um, for understanding uh, how the Turkish work, uh, the work that done in Turkey, uh, both corresponds to the global work and the ambitions uh, that are being laid out here. Uh, laid out here. Uh, we will turn to now Jeff Reisem. Um, I think talking about child-friendly cities, um, we are, is a quite interesting beginning uh, to look at it from a kind of a global UN convention point of view too. Uh, the experience uh, that Gail has. Um, where J Jeff is one of the partners. Uh, Jeff holds a, a degree in city design and social science from the London School of Economics and an architectural engineering degree from University of Colorado. Um, his educational background and international design experience combines the arts and sciences and provides a unique insight into technical as well as social aspects of urban design. And his work at Gale, uh, which we all admire as a kind of uh, the leading thought leaders on um, better cities for for all, uh, and I think this this work um, over decades has both created the the knowledge and the also um, 
the know-how actually of how to make these um, all of these aspirations in conventions in uh, in a kind of agreements across the globe how do they actually touch the ground when it comes to cities and in that i would like to ask you you guys have an expertise on public spaces in general um but what what is it uh, what is how do you see children's use of public spaces different um jeff yeah no thank you it's a pleasure to be here with all of these um great uh, experts and so i appreciate the opportunity and the introduction um well you know i think children's use of public space varies a lot from city to city uh, i think in the nordic cities you know we're very privileged in terms of i would say some of the best environments in the world for kids um I, you know i grew up in the us but i have lived in Denmark for 20 years and I have an eight and 11 year old myself. And it's, I'm, re I'm really, really grateful uh, to have the opportunity to raise my kids here. Uh, and I think what we see then in terms of my own experience and our work it, with, with public space is that if, um, you know, it, it, a lot of the city, uh, a lot of its major destinations uh, are accessible uh, with when you are young or when you're with uh, when you're with a child right major destinations uh, are easy to get to uh, by foot bike or public transit uh, i think also you know if a city is good for kids you'll see kids uh, like everywhere uh, and i think that's a, a trademark of, of nordic cities is that you know you see babies in large prams you see toddlers kind of gaining their balance right on, out on sidewalks uh, and in public squares you see young kids, you know, running and playing unsupervised. Uh, you see a lot of, you know, younger children uh, riding their bikes, uh, either with their parents or alone. Um, you see teens and preteens like socializing uh, in, in public space. So I think, you know, the visibility of children in public space is, uh, is a key. Uh, and, you know, we even see examples, there's extreme examples in Copenhagen where, where schoolyards double as public spaces, right? So. Uh, several schoolyards, they're open. They're full of kids, you know, during free sessions, uh, but then citizens use them throughout the day. So there's natural meeting places for the rest of society to come in contact uh, with kids. So the, um, the trust that's really inherent in that situation, I mean, imagine, you know, the trust that parents say, hey, yes, the schoolyard for my school is going to be an open public space with no big fence around it. Uh, the trust that the school gives the kids, where they told those kids on the first day of school, hey, there's this sort of imaginary line around this public space, don't go beyond that line. Uh, and yet, that still that, that trust still works, right? There doesn't need to be a fence or signs to keep people out, there can be true integration. So I think, you know, this use of public space is, as integral learning places and, and places of play is is pretty darn special and unique in nordic cities and it stands in contrast i think to other places where children are barely visible uh you might you, you try to isolate them in particular places you know put fences around stuff and uh and essentially have monofunctional um spaces whereas i think in a lot of nordic cities you have multifunctional uh places for children that are also really good uh for every every uh, every other citizen essentially Jeff, you, you kind of talked quite a bit actually about the indicators for good public spaces for children. Is there any that you forgot when? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's good to talk about more indicators. You know, I mentioned this overall indicator about kids being visible, uh, right? Um, and I think, you know, we saw the examples from Hella, these beautiful play playscapes. And I think there's also an indicator of, well, how many different locations are there where you see kids playing right it's not only the fixed beautifully designed places but if you integrate some of the natural materials if you integrate wood and nature and light then you will also you know see kids playing both in the programmed play areas but also in places that aren't uh necessarily programmed for them right so if you see kids integrating with uh non-play equipment i think that's also uh, a pretty big uh, a pretty big indicator and i think we've really tried you know we've developed a set of digital tools we call it the gale lens essentially 
which makes it easy for designers, city leaders, citizens, citizens themselves to actually measure what's going on, uh, right? So this is a tool that's like, it's web-based, it's digital, but where you can go out and essentially get another pair of glasses <laughs> by virtue of using this, uh, this app to see uh, your city uh, from a different perspective. So to, to, to document who's there, who's not, uh, what's going on, uh, who's visible and during what time of day, uh, and essentially by using some of these tools to really quantify these indicators, you get, again, a sense, this idea of some glasses of what's really happening, but then you also have a common language to talk to city leaders, stakeholders, designers, and say, hey, you know, I didn't see a single kid out on uh, the street when I was out there observing it all day. Why might that be? Is it because there's too much traffic? Is it because it's too far away from uh, other childcare institutions? Or is it because it's in the shade all day, right? So all of a sudden now we have a common sort of vocabulary to talk about things uh, and hopefully be much more, you know, action oriented in terms of being able to do something about um, whether or not kids feel invited and families feel welcome or if they don't. Do you, do you think this uh, uses of public spaces are changing during, COVID, during uh, this pandemic? Um, I guess it's an obvious question, but I'm curious uh, what, what you're seeing as a change? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, we've, we really took the opportunity as soon as Danish cities in particular went into lockdown last March to go out and find out, well, how does the city work? How do public spaces serve um, society when this major disruption is happening? So, you know, we, we use this tool that I mentioned, this Gale Lens. We went out and we understood that uh, both in Denmark and other cities, that we saw a lot more kids, maybe unsurprisingly, uh, because they weren't uh, in school all day. We also saw, uh, you know, a lot more exercise and play happening. And what was interesting is that we then we could compare what we saw sort of during the lockdown to after things opened up again. Uh, and we we noticed that the good public spaces that people essentially discovered for the first time, right? Maybe they were in their neighborhood, but they didn't have the reason or the time to go there. Well, when things were locked down, they went to certain public spaces. After life went back to normal last summer, those, those certain public spaces, they were used even more, right? So people were introduced to sort of maybe hidden parts of their neighborhood. They were introduced to new routines and new ways to enjoy uh, their city and went back to them and continued to use, uh, you know, to use them now through this second round of lockdowns and of course it's winter and everything but but i mean the what we found is that it's so in, you know the the quality of your local neighborhood and your local environment is just so vital for our, our everyday health essentially and for these like basic you know the basic uh, elements of being human that i think we all have an appreciation for now <laughs> during during covid uh about you know access to fresh air wonderful safe places to exercise to meet people and that's even more true you know if your kids are uh, if your kids are going to school at home or if you're having limited social contact then again these local places become even more vital and and uh, and really important so i hope that covid has taught us that some cities some neighborhoods might have a ton of access and privilege to these locations and a lot of other cities and neighborhoods don't and we hopefully can compare and contrast you know some of that use uh, across different locations and use the good, um, you know, some of these good public spaces that we see increased usage of as a as inspiration for making sure that we create many, many more, um, you know, uh, play areas or comfortable areas or nice place for kids and families close to um, close to where people live. And we have to distribute these public spaces, I think, in a, in a little bit different way, more decentralized um and that also means um just you know different decentralized funding uh, approaches uh, a different way of thinking about you know architecture and design it's not like the big prestigious one playground or big prestigious single square it's going to be a lot more of these small little locations these small little um sort of gyms that really can make a huge difference in people's everyday lives and especially uh, the everyday lives of kids 
And then um, I, I guess you mentioned um, some of these uh, urban solutions and green areas um, now that are becoming more important now, but how, how do you guys at Gale imagine um, a, a future of cities, let's say, why, is, why are these urban solutions more important now and how do you see it um, becoming even more important, I think, in the next decades? Yeah, yeah, I think, and, you know, some of this stuff, of course, we we knew uh, the idea of, you know, being a five minute walk uh, towards uh, green areas, um, the idea of the proximity, whether it be the 15 minute city or not. I think we knew some of those things before COVID, but now we have, um, I think we know more about what it takes and it actually doesn't need to take a lot. <laughs> it's not about money uh, or fancy materials and again hella and uh, showed that and many others have these things don't have to be expensive but they have to be um carefully considered from the perspective of of children and families so you know we need to learn from the places that are especially used uh during lockdown periods we need to learn about the places that are especially popular and then we need to you know be inspired, we don't need to copy them necessarily, but we need to be inspired from them, take some of those qualities and then distribute our investment, distribute our effort much more decentralized and much more uh, in sync with what sort of local communities needs in everyday life. And so that's a real challenge because um, it means that, you know, citywide strategies need to be tailored more to specific neighborhoods. It means that funding needs to be a little bit more decentralized. And so we need some, I think, new sets of tools, not only as designers, but also as funders and as city leaders to sort of evaluate uh, the success uh, of, of these small decentralized locations with some, with some new tools. So the, the, that decentralized nature is, is, I think, going to make the onus on designers and city leaders to listen and to learn <laughs> even more. And I think other speakers have mentioned that, uh, mentioned that as well. So we need some new processes for engaging folks and realize that it's, it's not going to be only about, um, you know, expensive, fancy interventions, but just very, you know, careful, uh, careful thought through sensitive ones that are based on uh, dialogue with locals will be, um, will be even more important. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is a really quite a um, aspiring goals that you're setting us for all of us uh, and I, it's quite a pleasure to be on a panel where there are decision makers there are funders uh, all all sides of this uh, i think equation is is in this room right now so thank you thank you for your insights um and last but not least uh, i would like to turn to gregor stan thompson uh, gregor is, is an architect um gra graduated from all school of architecture in in denmark uh, he has worked for uh, international firms both in rotterdam and in the in New York, since 2006, uh, he is in Istanbul uh, working as a, a Danish architect um, in between these two amazing cities. And I would like to first ask him, uh, how do you see your work, and what do you think is being an international uh, team um, or a, a person who who is bridging uh, different design agendas and experiences? What does that mean? Um, well, thank you, Salva, and first of all, thank you, everyone, for so generously sharing all your insights. And again, a real pleasure to be here, <clears throat> and also a pleasure to have actually engaged you all in some various ways uh, uh, working here in Istanbul. But I, I think uh, what is also clear uh, is that no one entity can can alone pull off big changes. Right. So I think uh, that's kind of uh, I think part of our learnings here from Istanbul. Uh, trying to make change here, uh, we actually have to work together uh, with uh, people in Copenhagen, uh, with people in Tirana, uh, with people in, in Tel Aviv, in order to understand and bring the best ideas uh, to a city uh, and then bring them back and see if this is what we learned here. Uh, so I think our role, uh, one of the roles we see ourselves and our practice uh, having uh, as architects and, and urbanly minded people um, is to be a mediator that can help uh, take big ideas and put them on the ground. 
And when when you say now uh, put them on the ground, what uh, what has been the experience so far in terms of um, from your perspective, the city um, better cities for children? What is your experience? Yeah. So uh, as a uh, Super Bowl, we have engaged in a number of different uh, experiments. You could say we, everything from uh, building prototype playground playgrounds to facilitating uh, a learning program that. Uh, helps uh, sharing the best knowledge on how to do pop-up playgrounds in Istanbul, uh, but also taking uh, staff from municipalities to Copenhagen and say, hey, see, this is uh, how they do it here, or uh, uh, going to Tirana together. Uh, but also facilitating very, let's say, to some degree, less exciting <clears throat> uh, training programs as the safety standards uh, I think we touched upon earlier. Uh, so I think there is many different small pieces that goes in to make a big change. Uh, and again, that has been our role to, to sort of bring all the pieces together here uh, from the best colleagues around the world. Well, I'm very curious, uh, is there a kind of umbrella project that uh, is facilitating this or how, who, who is driving um, Yes, so we have been fortunate enough to, to work with the Dutch Foundation uh, and their uh, program called Urban 95. Uh, that framework says, uh, asked, uh, what would you change if you could see the city from 95 centimeters, uh, the health of a, uh, the height of a healthy three-year-old. Um, I think that has served as a, as a vehicle that we're able to pull the, everything from Gale and Arab, uh, Hele, um, uh, but also the, the Danish consulate into being active players uh, into facilitating uh, changes here. Um, it's not always easy as a, or it's impossible, you could say, as a small practice uh, in Istanbul to uh, to reach these uh, uh, players that have access to knowledge and has access to, to distributing the right ideas. Uh, so you need, uh, again, uh, the, a bigger framework that helps facilitate uh, and, and convince mayors that, you know, change is necessary, uh, that then can trickle down through the system that, uh, or let's say create buy-in in the municipalities that, yes, this is an important agenda that we need to adopt. Could you tell us a little bit more about next steps? Um... Where, where do you see um, Istanbul's learning moving forward? I think Istanbul has a role as a, as a mega city, uh, one of the few in Europe, you would say. Uh, it's a ginormous city uh, for European standards. Uh, and you can say one pop-up here or one prototype playground there, it doesn't really create a big change. Um, uh, in a city of this scale. Uh, so it, it, though you have to do them first in order to create a local knowledge, uh, it, it also serves as a kind of starting point for how to think, how can we scale them? Or how can we implement 100 pop-ups uh, throughout the city, 100 uh, temporary playgrounds, uh, 100 um, uh, community centers where services are delivered to, to children. Um, and I think that can probably feed back to maybe even Copenhagen, but maybe you know it all, uh, Jeff, already. Um, but I think the yeah, there is a there is a, a step change that needs to happen when you go from a, from smaller, well managed cities to big monsters uh, as Istanbul. Like how how can you maintain con uh, not control, but at least uh, how can you make sure that impact happens? Um, when we then look to beyond the borders of Istanbul, looking further south uh, in cities that are much more, uh, much larger than Istanbul, uh, much more, uh, let's say, chaotic in their in their structure, uh, Istanbul to some degree is a just a mediocre big city, um, but it's relatively well managed, I would say. So. Um... Kind of, a, I think I would like to ask uh, one one last question: um, Is how 
I, th I think uh, maybe you started thinking on that, uh, Craig, is a little bit now, but um, well, what is there for the Nordic experience to, is, is there something about speed? Is there something about uh, to, to also glean from the Istanbul experiences? Like what, what are the, I think you're in a very special uh, place for having lived in Istanbul for 15 years and also practiced here as an architect. When, when you go back, what, what do you want to take with you? Yeah, I, I think it's something we also learned uh, through our practice, right? Then nothing happens before you really try it or do it. And, uh, so you had you uh, things we did here as a as a practice of architecture, where typically we sit in front of our computer and, and click the mouse. Is actually we we went out and did our own pop up playgrounds uh, and and learned from that uh, and. Now we know how to do a pop-up playground, and we can communicate that knowledge further on to to other uh, entities that need need that or could need that knowledge. Um, yes, Istanbul is a is a fast city, and sometimes we have uh, direct access to to the municipality here as well. Uh, as we heard Hille describe, that it's also possible in Copenhagen. Um, and I know you're also teaching in London. What's mm. what's um, is some of this learning also? What what is the content of the teaching in London? Is there anything that you can tell us about what um, the learning is benefiting also? Yeah, I think the the for for our cities to thrive, right? We we now I'm talking from the arch, point of arch, uh, view of an architect. Uh, we have a, a great understanding of the spatial quality of the of the city um, and what works, what, what doesn't work. Um, and I think we are looking for a role where architects can be uh, more uh, direct active participants in city making beyond getting commissions from the city or uh, from a local developer. I, I think sometimes uh, uh, architects can be much more directly involved in uh, city making too, uh, but it requires that we have new tools uh, such as you know, more more knowledge on uh, what it takes up to to create a nonprofit business or, or similar. Uh, but also bring in partners in, in, into this, uh, on, uh, be direct active participants in the city. I think that's our dream as as an office. Uh, how can we be change makers on the ground? Thank you so much, Craig, um, for sharing your um, insights from the practice and the 15 years you've been in Istanbul. Um, uh, I'm going to look at Annette now. Um, uh, thank you. I will have to thank the Danish consulate in Istanbul to, to organize this amazing event. And it was an honor to be a moderator uh, to such wonderful expertise coming together. Um, there, there are not too many questions in the, um, in the chat box. Um, how, how should we pr proceed in it? I think we have uh, time for a couple of questions, if uh, if there is one or two, um, Selva, and then I think we should round off and, uh, and thank all of our distinguished speakers for this amazing and very insightful uh, sharing of knowledge and experience around uh, cities for children. So, um, so if there's one question then then let's have that and uh and then let's uh, close for today thanks a lot pleasure uh, there's one question that uh, is shared uh, during Helle's presentation but i think it would also um apply to many of you um it's Chata, i'm looking at you for for this as well maybe jeff you might have some some responses to it and the question is um that we we talked about how um Pedestrians and cyclists deserve more of the city than the motor motorists and uh, and the cars basically. And uh, uh, the question continues saying this is maybe easy in Copenhagen, uh, but more car dependent cities are having difficulty with, uh, with this transition. Even cities like Dortmund uh, has been mentioned in the question that uh, announced a quite ambitious reformation program, but then had to scale it back because of. Um, pushbacks from the community. So how do you convince residents and municipalities that a shift in our cities 
is urgent and uh, would actually benefit uh, in the long term. So I'll ask this first to Hele and, uh, and then to Chautai and to Jeff uh, for last comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, and I, I'll have to say that I'm not an expert on uh, 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 transportation infrastructure and logistics, but I can see how cities around the globe are becoming more and more dense leaving less space for children's outdoor play spaces in school and daycare centers, for instance. And we are talking in this panel, we are talking a lot about making a lot of new places where people can can go out and and be together and so on. But where, where should we find the room for that? I think it's obvious that it is not a sustainable developing to see uh, more and more dense cities and of course, I know this couldn't be changed overnight, but it's a dream. Uh, and I'm quite sure that it will change. So we will see less cars in the future. But maybe some of the others have a comment, if not a solution on this question. Sure. I would like to turn to Chatai as a city administrator. How, how are you managing um, a shift in, in change? Oh, could you unmute yourself? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Actually, I'm not an expert too, but you know, uh, during the past years, cycling uh, has been promoted in Istanbul as an alternative to other modes of transportation. And, uh, you know, um, we would like to reduce the use of private vehicles uh, powered by fossil fuel. And uh, Especially when we talk about fossil fuel, it's uh, it's one of our subjects. You know, uh, we would like to reach a green Istanbul. So um, that's a very important mode of transportation for us, and we are trying to design our parks and other uh, areas every time with uh, bicycle lanes. Actually, I think uh, Copenhagen uh, has more information about that knowledge because. Istanbul, because of its topography and other, uh, you know, some obstacles, uh, we are not good at that uh, transportation type, but uh, we are trying to pass uh, to bicycle lanes and we would like to uh, create more bicycle lanes in Istanbul. And this is our uh, approach to this topic. Thank you so much. And, and Jeff, maybe you are the most expert on this, so you get the last word on that. Um, answering this question. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's uh, it's tough. I mean, I guess I would just say that I'm not sure. Well, 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 two things, right? Like, of course, we know the money is is tight, right? So we have to think of some other, some new, I think, interesting ways to fund some of this stuff. I think to um, Hella's point, I actually think we can we have the we have the space and I think some, I, I would almost argue that, you know, the right kind of density can be a good thing and we can utilize the little, you know, breathing holes or the little spots in the city just more effectively and efficiently. Um, so I, so I think we have the space. It's more about utilizing uh, what we have a whole lot better. And I, I'm really taken by the example I mentioned before, just about, uh, you know, which is like, you know, Coba Architects, another architecture company with this ability to make a schoolyard that's also a public space that is financed through parking underneath. And so I think we actually need to have much more creative sort of collaborations and partnerships, um, public private citizen that will allow us to find the right locations, help us right size the sort of right type of intervention, and then ultimately also pay and maintain it. Uh, so we have to, yeah, we have to actually be much more joined up in our thinking and it's, and, uh, and that'll, that'll help solve the problem. Well, we have a recipe now. So thank you so much for uh, being with us. I, could I ask all of you to say, um, goodbye in person? Would you, would you mind turning on your mics and? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> Thank <laughs> you.